Welcome into Q's with Q. This is going to be a weekly Friday segment, diving into your questions about the Baltimore Ravens, their upcoming opponent, and also looking back on their previous matchup. This is powered by Missile Training. Visit missiletraining.com for all of your sports and performance needs. And I know, guys, a, a tough week one loss for the Ravens, but we, we can't dwell on that anymore. We got to turn the page. The Ravens have to turn the page. It's going to be a week two matchup. They have to get right against this Las Vegas Raiders team and making sure they can get a win under their belt against the team that might not be up to the Chiefs level, but can still give them a fight. Here's the crazy thing about it, Kev, uh, Ryan. We're looking at two teams that are over, over one. Um, they both play AFC conference uh, opponents and to stay on pace, stay on 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 track towards a playoff berth, you got to take care of the teams in your division and you definitely got to take care of teams in your conference. So this is a real pivotal matchup. You can't really sleep on any game this year, but in particular, this game has a little bit more weight. And I think, again, if we look at what the teams look like as far as, you know, uh, these past week's games, Baltimore Ravens are an upper tier team. Make no mistake about it. I like the way they competed against the Kansas City Chiefs. They were on the road. They had some new pieces, new faces as far as coaches were concerned. And they put together a really strong performance. They were a toe away. Toe, just big toe, toe away from getting it done uh, or at least having a chance because we also know that they were going for two. So it was an opportunity to put themselves in a position to win the game. They come up short. Here comes Las Vegas, home opener. What are you going to do? I think this is really where you validate all the good that came out of last week's game by playing a team like Las Vegas at home who, yes, they have their skill positions and players that are really dynamic as well. But you also know that they're going to be hungry to jump on a road and get a strong win against an opponent like the Baltimore Ravens. So a lot of intrigue in this game, but I'm looking for week one. Give us all of what you saw that was good, all the things that you need to improve upon, and let's go get it versus the Raiders. Yeah, and that's a great point, though, Q, right? As much as you want to start off, everyone wants to start off with the victory week one. But look, not everyone's going to have the teams are going to lose. Baltimore was one of them. And but one thing is every team wants to get that first win out of the way. And if you're a good team, which we expect not only is Baltimore a good team, we think they're a great team. You come on home, you even your record and you keep moving. But now, guys, let's move past week one. Let's move past all of the good, bad, ugly, and everything in between. Let's talk about this matchup here, and let's go with the offensive side here first, Q. One of the things that was brought up, and we saw it in the first drive of the game against Kansas City, the Ravens did run the ball a lot. Now, we saw Lamar Jackson scrambling, but one of the weaknesses that the Raiders had, and thanks to a couple former Ravens, J.K. Dobbins in particular, they gashed the Raiders here. So one thing it seems like we want to see, Q, is the Ravens with this power run game that they have being able to really exploit a Raiders defense that seems to have holes, especially in the run game. One of the things that you look at from just global National Football League coaches, it sounds cliche, but it really isn't. And it's running the ball. And why? Because you get a chance to run and have time of possession. If you win on first and second down, there is no third down. If there is no third down, you are in control of the clock. You're in control of the downs. You stay ahead of the chains. It gives you a chance to put points on the board. Now, it wasn't the greatest game last week by any stretch as far as scoring-wise for either team, but that grittiness of that Greg Roman-led run offense certainly showed up. It showed up extremely well. You look at what, uh, yeah, that – for the Kansas City Chiefs game, and Kevin, I promise you, you know Todd Monk is going to be sitting there like, so if I have Lamar and I got Derrick Henry in the backfield, there was some success. I just got to figure out how this offensive line can go ahead and stay consistent because if they stay consistent, I think we are going to see a repeat performance of a dominant run offense 
like we saw with the uh, Las Vegas or Los Angeles uh, Chargers did to the Las Vegas Raiders. Something that, and that's the Ravens' identity. Even though things have changed, you know, or changing the offensive philosophy, the Ravens still want to run the football. You got a monster in Derrick Henry. You have Lamar Jackson, who he was doing everything we saw with his legs, being able to get outside the pocket, or even some design runs, read options. They are a force, but you got to be able to make the right blocks. You got to be able to set it up the right way. And for Kansas City, they did a good job of that. Raiders, not a great job, especially for a team when you look at the Chargers last week. They had a lot of inexperience from in their wide receiver room and even their whole all their pass catchers. Not a lot of guys that you're sitting there that you are game planning around. But then it kind of leads, Kevin, to this other point here. As much as we want to see the Ravens get the run game involved, of course everyone would love to see the pass game take another step. Who wouldn't? But I think the one question that people are having after week one is, is Isaiah likely supplanting Mark Andrews? Is there a worry here? I think you and I are on the same wavelength, but clearly that is a conversation that people are looking towards here as we head into week two. It is. And I am of the mindset, and I think a lot of people are, that, you know, they both compliment each other. This was not Isaiah likely taking Mark Andrews job. This was not, you know, Isaiah likely all of a sudden pushing Mark Andrews out of Baltimore. It's just what the game script and game flow dictated in week one. And the Ravens were smart to use it that way. The chiefs made it a point to take away Mark Andrews and it ended up working. And so they said, beat us anywhere else, but with Mark Andrews. And so the Ravens said, okay, we have this guy named Isaiah likely. We're going to show you what he has. And that's why he ended up having that game with a tune of nine catches, 111 yards. And that score could have been two, but Q said just a shoe size too big on that, on that end line there at the end of the game. But, I think that this is a big bounce back week for Mark Andrews. And I think that this is more of what we're going to see. This is going to be the norm is my prediction, or at least one of them for this game where you can use those two tight end sets. You talked about running the ball there, that heavy personnel. If you get that run game going, that play action is a really big part of what you do because teams creep up and they start saying, we have to sell out more to stop the run, more defenders in the box. They put in more of their personnel. And then I don't know about you guys, but I feel pretty confident with Mark Andrews, Isaiah likely one-on-one -on -one against a slower linebacker or against the safety that's more of a box guy. I feel more confident in that, whereas it just keeps defenses off guard. And we saw it in 2019 when the Ravens had that historic rushing offense. That was more three tight end sets, but they were able to work play action off of that, and Mark Andrews feasted off of that. Hayden Hurst got his opportunities. Even Nick Boyle sometimes got in on the pass-catching action. They used those guys in tandem with each other, and I think with a guy like Likely, who is that athletic and can be lined up in so many places, and for Andrews, we know who Mark Andrews is. There's no question of who Mark Andrews is. Using those guys in tandem and having that split be more even, I think, is the norm of what we're going to see this season. And it might be in Q. It kind of falls into this, the question I have for you. And obviously, Isaiah Likely, playmaking-wise, reminds me of Kevin, you and your prime, obviously. Very agile, versatile after the catch. Right. But one thing that I did notice and Q, maybe you can allude or can touch on this is because last week I was looking at snap percentages here. Mark Andrews uh, team snap percentage was just almost 74 percent. Isaiah likely it was over 66 percent. But a lot of times Mark Andrews was helping to stay in at times and chip because of the issues that they were having on the offensive line. And I already know that who your number one priority for the Ravens, who they got to watch here, and I'll let you explain. But it seems to me that the Ravens, if they're going to trust one of their tight ends to stay in and block, Mark Andrews is going to have to do some dirty work as they're trying to figure out the offensive line. Okay, like, let's, let's just be realistic here. Their package with both tight ends in a game gives them flexibility to run – to either one and or overload to one side or the other. We're forgetting about number 88 in Charlie Kolar because in the game where early on Derek Henry was running well, you had Charlie Kolar in the game, and there were some instances where, yeah, he was absolutely effective at the point of attack. You got Pat Ricard as well. So it's not that Mark Andrews is going to be a blocking tight end. 
just not going to happen. There will be times where he will be called upon. There's difference between I'm a blocking tight end and I'm Mark Andrews. Mark Andrews is going to be out that passing route and making some plays there. I think what we also saw, uh, Kevin Ryan, is the fact that when you got Lamar Jackson, you got a guy that can extend plays. Max Crosby for the Raiders is the guy that we're all kind of like, he's priority number one. Chris Jones was priority number one for the Kansas City Chiefs. Max Crosby is priority number one when it comes to making sure we got to identify where he's at. Now, he's he had some struggles, the tackles, whether it be Roger Rosengard or, heck, even Pat McCarry, for that matter, had some struggles. And the tape shows it. It's not us just trying to make it up as we go, but they had their struggles. And I think if it is a scenario where you're going to run it effectively, run it at Crosby. Go ahead and, 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 and force him to make a decision. And that's where the running game gets into your favor when you're able to wear down your opponent. Okay, put in uh, 88, put in Pancake Pat and let both Kolar and Pancake go ahead and double team them up and then allow uh, Derrick Henry to, to, to get off uh, to the outside or, for that matter, Lamar Jackson being able to have that counteraction where you have flow one direction and then Lamar going the opposite direction. We've seen it. It's in the offense. Let it be as far as with the Raiders because you do. You want to... As I say, keep them off balance. Don't let them get into the rhythm. But no matter what, know where number 98 is on the field. And if you can nullify just the high motor and and just badassness uh, when you look at the, the bigger picture of, of play with Max Crosby, you're, 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 you're winning. The reason why uh, 135 yards of rushing was had by – um, J.K. Dobbins. It was the commitment to run, but it was the runs that they had that made the difference. I'm glad you mentioned who priority one not wants to be again for Baltimore. You're right on with Chris Jones. And everyone, if you watch that game, Chris Jones was a game wrecker. Max Crosby is a game wrecker for the Las Vegas Raiders. Honestly, he's probably their most valuable piece on that defensive side. He doesn't give up. He's a dog. He loves the physicality. And that is something that is going to be a challenge. But you just gave some reasons. Hey, run at him. Double team him. Make him work a little extra harder to try to get a play or to wreak havoc on Baltimore here. We will see how it all unfolds. But now for all Ravens fans, if you didn't know the name Max Crosby, I'm going to say it one more time. Max <laughs> Crosby. If you don't believe us, go look up his highlight tape. The dude just is a good football player, great football player. So offense, that's kind of where it is. We know what the Ravens are capable of doing. We feel pretty confident on the defensive side. I know Zach Orr is different here, and Kevin, I can let you tee up Q with this. But there was some news, or at least uh, it was flattering for the Ravens, or at least for Lamar Jackson. Uh, he's got a big fan on the Vegas Raiders and Devontae Adams. And Devontae Adams, one of the best receivers in the league, one of the best route runners, very complimentary. I don't think we're going to see Devontae in a Ravens uniform. But if there's one target, Kevin, you can uh, let Q then answer what they need to do. But the number one uh, weapon that, that the Raiders have, there's no ands, ifs, or buts, it's Devontae Adams. Yeah, and kind of like what we were just talking about with, with Mark Andrews. It's it's make someone else beat you. Make someone else beat you. So for the Ravens, obviously, uh, they'll probably be throwing a bunch of different looks over at Devontae Adams. They'll probably be figuring out ways they can blanket or do whatever they want and say, hey, Brock Bowers, Jacoby Myers, those guys are the guys you want to try to have beat you as opposed to one of the best wide receivers in the NFL and Devontae Adams. So, hey, Lamar Jackson and Devontae Adams would be a heck of a duo, but – I mean, I think that in you're talking this game here, it's important because you want to eliminate the stars as best as you can. Maybe not completely stop them, but slow them down as much as you can. I, I think when you look at Zach Orr's defense, um, it has the capability of being a matchup oriented defense. I would be pleasantly surprised uh, to see if it's Marlon Humphreys who what we call travel. Um, is he going to travel 
from wherever. So if he's on the left side, Devontae's on the left side, that's all well and good. But then if he now goes in motion, are you traveling with him? Or if he comes right out and he's the lining up on the right side, do you swap it over and travel over there to match up with him if you're Marlon? Uh, do you have, you know, Brandon Stevens and company that I think, you know, is, you know, well within the, the capabilities of matching up with him? Sure, of course, no question about it. Uh, but, but I think it would be intriguing to see if they, in fact, do have a matchup. Um, let someone else beat you by doubling him on critical downs. Every time you try to pressure Devon or the Raiders, Devontae Adams, like his statistics is off the charts when it comes to being effective against pressure looks. They get him the ball. Why? Because he knows how to create separation. He knows where the holes are on the defense and his catch radius. I mean, it's just one of the superior ones in the game, if not the best in the game. So there's a lot there, uh, gentlemen, when you talk about, you know, what he brings to the Las uh, Vegas Raiders arsenal. Um, if you're pressuring Gardner Minshew, and we all know Gardner up close and personal from when he was with the Colts last year and kind of a thorn in our side. But I'm telling you, like, let him go ahead and, and do what he needs to do uh, where it is. Marlon over him, traveling with him. And then there's an awareness of, especially in pressure looks, of double teaming him. Let someone else go ahead and beat you. And the other name, too, that it's not Devontae Adams, just so people can know, they got Jacoby Myers. There was a former Patriot settled in in Vegas. Very solid second wide receiver option. But I'll tell you what, they drafted a tight end pretty high this past year. Brock Bowers, and Bowers was very active in game one for the Raiders. Gardner Minshew looked his way a lot, and he also liked to do some check downs to Madison as their third down back. But if you stop Devontae Adams, Q, is what we're, we've gotten to, you feel really good about your opportunities because that is their big play threat consistently. And if you can shut that down and make Gardner and the offense earn it, then, yeah, you're going to be feeling pretty good. But if Devontae is running around the field doing whatever he wants, uh, I can guarantee you a lot of Ravens fans are going to be pretty stressed out for four quarters of football. Or last time Gardner was in Baltimore with the Colts, they shocked the Ravens and went to overtime. But we're not even going to think about that. But, Kev, what we do need to think about, since we went to both sides, the Ravens overall knocking on wood. I don't want to say it, that the injuries have been okay, but there was one key one that they had coming out of game one, and it was revolving around Kyle Van Noy. Yeah, Kyle Van Noy suffered an uh, orbital fracture in, in week one and obviously was laying down on his stomach when it happened, took a little while for him to get off the field, and there is a whole other layer of, of controversy in terms of his treatment and what ended up happening. But Van Noy was on the practice field for the Ravens on Friday. And a little bit of a surprise because some of the timelines for that can be a lot longer than just a couple of days or a week. So I know Q with your sports performance background, we don't necessarily know all the specifics and there are multiple different levels of what this injury could be. But in any case, are you a little surprised that he was back on the field this soon for Baltimore? We don't know where, as far as his portal bone, was the, the degree of the fracture um, it is a case where he was saying his pad kind of shut down violently after Namdi uh, Matabike landed on him, and I think that's what caused the fracture to, to kind of occur. What I look at is, okay, that happened. How is he going to, number one, heal, but then number two, prevent it from uh, getting worse, and, and how do you play – without hurting your team. Uh, clearly going out there, if it, if it was a scenario where it was mild, clearly it seems like it's mild if he's out there practicing. I'm sure there wasn't a lot of, you know, training camp type hitting for him, but it is something that you got to be concerned with. It is something that you got to, you know, recognize. And I think for him, it's okay, cool. Um, I feel comfortable and confident going out there for practice. Let's see how it is the next day. Usually when it's mild the next day, it's a good, strong indication that guys will, in fact, play.
But if there is an indicator where, man, it's, you know, giving him a headache or something along those lines where he isn't up to what his full capabilities are, then I think we're not going to be seeing him play. It's early on here, and I'm, I'm glad, Q, you could mention with the injuries. And for those that are knowing, like, that understand with any type of injury in any sport, but football, as violent as it is, you really don't know the layers of certain injuries, but specifically when you have to deal with a fracture in the orbital region, head region, you also just want to be careful. You don't want to make a situation worse than it is, especially if you're on the right trajectory. And so it's encouraging, but there are more layers into that that we got to see and, and, and see how it unfolds. And it is exciting that football's back, but man, it's a marathon. Q, you know that better than anyone that uh, we still got, I got to work on my math here. It's September. The Ravens are hoping to be playing in February. We got at least, what, five months to go. So we'll see. We got a long way. But there is one other thing, speaking of, unfortunately, with another injury, not Ravens related. We'll close with this. And, again, we're going to keep doing this every Friday, talking and answering your questions in the future about the Baltimore Ravens and football beyond. But the big storyline cue last night was the concussion to Tua Tagovailoa of the Miami Dolphins. And Tua, it's been documented, the concussions over the prior years. Scary moments, the one specifically that everyone remembers watching Thursday night against the Bengals. And that was the one that, that just continues to ring in people's minds. Yesterday, it's a scramble. Head is awkwardly hits against DeMar Hamlin of all players. And you could tell instantly that there was an impact for Tua ruled out for the game. You know, Q, in your perspective, and you've been around being able to play and now being outside of the game, just wanted you to touch on the magnitude of concussions and head injuries and something that two is really going to have to consider, and every football player out there has to consider mm -hmm. um, as they continue on in their professional careers. You know, um, it's interesting because Antonio Pierce, uh, the head coach for the Las Vegas uh, Raiders, he came out and said that, you know, in so many words, Tua should consider retiring and not playing anymore. And I think when you're in the thick of competition, you don't really know any other way. And, and so whether it be the fat contract he signed, the leadership validation that uh, was bestowed on him by his fellow teammates, um, just the inner competitor in him and the legacy he wants to leave on a game and the, you know, the people of Miami, all those things come into play and you just don't want to walk away from the game. And that's extremely difficult. But when you look at the bigger picture of life, I mean, it's a fraction of the game or a fraction of time, rather, that you play the game. And then you got the rest of your time to really concentrate on living, being a father, being a husband, um, interacting with family, interacting with friends. You know, you, you don't want to put that extra burden upon your family uh, nor your friends. And obviously being there for your children will be of the utmost importance, too. So there's a lot at stake to decide and make decisions on. Um, but when I look at it from a bigger picture standpoint, you know, there are, you know, really some strong things that he needs, to, protocols that he needs to put in place to help him heal his brain. And if, if, if he's thinking about coming back, like either A, put him on IR, let that dude just sit for a period of time and then reevaluate from there before you even consider those next steps. I think that at the bare, bare, bare minimum is what needs to be done. At the end of the day here, and as we wrap it up, it's uh, the game is a short amount of time of your career. It can give you so many opportunities in life. And Q, I know for you, it's given you an opportunity. One, you got to live out a dream and to be a professional athlete. You got to, to win a Super Bowl and, and try to chase things on a personal professional or whatever your athletic achievements that you maybe grew up wanting to do childhood dreams you got to do that but then understanding this window of your playing career is so short when you look at the grand scheme of things if you're lucky in the nfl i don't even know what the the average nfl kevin is at four years playing in the nfl now three and a half yeah right right around 
Two to three years. Two to three years. So whatever it may be, very short. And then you hope to have a long life after and you get to experience many other things. You're a you're going to be a regular or, or a non-athlete, non-professional longer than you are for your playing career. And that's where it's looking at. The, the biggest thing, hopefully, too, is all right. Hopefully he gets right and he makes the right decision for himself and for his family moving forward. But it's just moments that make you cringe when it happens just because it's the nature of the beast. But no one ever wants to see people go through that, uh, especially when they've had scares. And we know concussions. You don't know the ramifications. Um, we've had a lot of people talk on that. That's the, that's the, the scary thing with the brain. You really don't know uh, what 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 can actually impact people over time. So, yeah, I think that kind of wraps up. Kevin, any other thoughts that you can take us home here? No, just that it's important for Baltimore to to get a win. I know that zero and two is not necessarily a, oh your season's over, but certainly you know the the numbers last year. I believe only one team made the playoffs last year after starting zero and two, and that was the Houston oh. Texans. So, man, the Ravens need a win here. Hopefully they'll be able to get it. And I think a statement would go a long way just for confidence for a lot of different reasons, even when you're talking about that offensive line and others as well. So again, starting off the year with two AFC West opponents, hopefully you can go one and one, but for Baltimore, it's about establishing momentum and getting on the same page with everybody. So I think that's all we have for you here on Q's with Q. Again, this will be a weekly Friday segment. We'll be answering all of your Baltimore Ravens questions and posts to put your questions in will be throughout the week, you know, spotted in on different days. So if you have a question about the Ravens, the NFL in general, be sure to put that down below. For Kadri Ismail and Ryan Ripken, I am Kevin Ostriker, and this has been Q's with Q.